Good morning, everyone. We thank you for participating in this webinar. And we're going to go ahead and get started because it's 10 o'clock and we want to stay to our, our time frame. We hope that you can hear me and that you can see the presentation. If you cannot, please um, send me an email, uh, shoot it to the question box, and um, we just want to make sure that we, you can hear and see the webinar. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. I am Ursula Kelly, and I'm a grant specialist, and I work with the Accountability Court. And first of all, I want to say um, this workshop agenda, we have like three sections. Um, the training and travel reimbursements, we're really not going to go over this today. We'll do that in the future. But we will do section one and section two um, today. And if you have not turned in your award packet, I ask that you do mail it uh, to us as soon as possible so that we can activate your grant award um, so that you can start spending your money. Today we will go over the fiscal and the programmatic responsibilities related to this grant. Now I will introduce the staff members that will that are sitting in with me today. I have Virginia Dixon. She started um, in early May, and she is responsible now for the A grant which is um, A15, which is the Juvenile and DUI Courts. And I also have Rand Helfner, and she is the person that is responsible for the court output reports. And she is a part of our SEC Center, our Statistical Analysis Center here at CJCC. And she will do the programmatic piece. We want to make sure that you have our contact information Please note our website and our mailing address, our phone number and our fax number. And we just want to remind everyone that it's very important to, when you're sending email to us, that you make it to either myself or Virginia's uh, attention or put grant on it. And also include your grant number. If it's J158001, put that on there. Or if it's A15001, please put that on there. That will help our mail center get it to us as soon as possible. When calling, you can also call us on the main number if you cannot um, or don't have our main number um, handy. Call our main number, which is 404-657-1956, and they will transfer you to us. In this first section, um, we will go over the financial piece, like I said, and then Rand will go over the promatic piece. We will cover this information kind of quickly, um, so you might not be able to write notes, but we will uh, have this presentation on our website, and we'll probably email it out to you as well, and it will be uh, available later today or if by the end of the week. This workshop should last approximately one hour with a lot of time to address questions. Um, it's most of the information you already know. Uh, the new information that we'll be going over today is the match and also some new information about the LSI and the court output report. Your subgrant award, most of you, like I said, have already seen in your award package, but we wanted to go over this very quickly um, so that you know the importance of this subgrant award. Um, the subgrantee, your name will be listed in that area, and the implementing agency is the county or city that's your fiscal agent, along with the project name. If you are adult felony or family court or juvenile court, that will be your project name. Along and below that is your subgrant number, and that will be J158001 or whatever your number is, as long also with the A15 for the juvenile and the DUI court. Also on this sheet, this time was different, where it says federal funds. Of course, we know that these are state funds. You would find your total award. Below that, your matching funds. This time, most of you have matching funds unless you send in a waiver saying that you could not come up with your matching funds. And then your total award would be 
The state funds plus the matching funds will be your total funds. And our grant period this time started July the 1st and will end June the 30th, 15. Also, we put an X on this table because we want you to know that it's very important that you have the signature of the authorized official sign this form because it's not a legal binding uh, document until that person has signed it. And why we brought this up because a lot of people, um, the, the documents were signed by other people, but we need the authorized official. And who is that? The authorized official is the board chair or the mayor. And once they sign this, they can delegate um, signing authority to someone else but they first must sign the award packet. This can be delegated with a formal request on your agency's letterhead. Signing authority can be delegated only for the day-to-day -day operations of handling this grant. Also, the letter only permits authority for the grant period listed in the previous slide, which was July 1 to June 30, 15. So I'm not for sure this year that they will offer supplemental, but if they do, that document has to be signed by the authorized official. Not the de designee, but the authorized official. Next, we're going to move on to our subgrant adjustment request, which is known as the SAR, that's the SAR. When you send in your award packet, SAR number one was used to activate your grant. Once the subgrant adjustment request was submitted to revise the budget to change, it can be used to um, do adjustments, change project officials and addresses, project personnel and goals and objectives. And say that your project director leaves and you get a new one. You cannot send us an email, but you must use this form for us to change it in the system. It must be on this form um, for us to do that. So all of those things can be done with the, the, um, the adjustment request. This is how the adjustment request um, looks. And we really, when you're sending these in, we really need you to fill the entire form out, starting with the date. Please fill in the date at the top, the nature of the adjustment, and then section one. This is where, if it's monetary, you use this to subtract and add where appropriate. Um, if you're moving monies around, this is where you do that. In section three, this is um, used to uh, put in the revisions for project officials, addresses, project personnel, goals, and objectives. And then section four is very important. This is where you do your justification um, for the revision. So we need you to fill this in and tell us why you want us to move this money around because we have to then go to the, to the funding committee and ask can we move these funds around. So it's very important that you do that. And lastly, we need you to sign this form and date it. And this form can be, it doesn't have to be signed by the authorized official, but it can be signed by the project director or the financial person, the director, uh, finance director for your agency. Request for reimbursement. We want you to know that you can do your reimbursement monthly or quarterly, and however you do them, they still do 15 days after the quarter or the month. It's 15 days for either way that you're doing them. And this year, we want you to know that we are going to be um, looking at when you send those in. We're going to monitor the deadline, so we want you to get them to us as close on that deadline, the 15th, as possible, because we will be monitoring that. If it's not listed in your approved budget, you cannot claim it. So make sure that you have your budget handy and up to date. This is the reimbursement request. This form is what comes to our office for your reimbursement. It's commonly known as a turnaround document, meaning once you submit one, the next SER will be sent to you. For example, you submit number one, number two will automatically be generated and mailed to you. 
Also on the SER, this is where you will list your matching funds. And since we're talking about matching funds, I'll go ahead and kind of go into detail. Um, on this form, you will put your total. Then under that, it says federal funds, so we know that that's the state funds, and then your match. Say if this SER was $8,000, you would, how to calculate the match, if this is $8,000, you would divide it by nine, and that would give you the match that you need to send in to us for this particular reimbursement. And what I mean sending to us, um, the invoices and the payment where it's been um, paid to meet your match requirement. So with each SER, you would take the total and divide it by nine, and that would give you the match. So I know some of you are thinking, say, if you're using match um, treatment as match, and in the first three months, your total match is $10,000. And since you're using treatment and you met that, can I go ahead and send that in to meet my match requirement? Yes, you can. When you send it in, please have it labeled, and we can force our system to take your entire match and you will meet it. So then the next three, four, whatever SERs that you send in uh, to the end of the grant period, you won't be required to send in match. So yes, you can send it in, in at one time or you can send it in with each reimbursement. All grant related expenses incurred for the month must be listed on this form to obtain reimbursement, and that's the SER. Expenses must be incurred during the grant period, and this form must be signed by the authorized grant official or designate. And we do need the original, so please send those in. And it must be sent in via mail, not email, but mail, because we need that original signature. And all of the supporting documents need to be sent in as well. Support documents should include purchase orders, invoices, and proof of payment. And also, at the same time, you will send in your match, and it must be labeled um, to help us out in processing um, your payments more quickly. If you could even label everything that you're sending in, if you're sending in invoices for supplies, if you could put them all together and at the top with a paper clip or even a sticky note, put these are all my supply invoices. These are all my other category invoices that will help us so much in um, processing your SER more quickly. Also at the bottom of this slide, it says, please note, do not send in items unrelated to your reimbursement request. And what we mean by that, sometimes we receive items that um, the county has paid and we don't even need them, but you send them in. And it kind of confuses us because we add them into our total and then you're over, and then we don't know what to do, and then we have to call you. So if it's not related to the reimbursement and we don't need to pay it, don't send it in to us. Like your cell phone bills, your rent, and water bill, we don't need those invoices. Please note, failure to submit any of these required items might um, make your SER, it might be denied or short. Why is my check short or less than I requested? Because of mathematical error, expenses outside of the grant period, expenditures were submitted that were not on your approved budget, and we do check those budgets when you send in your items, and lack of supporting documentation. We need everything so that we can pay this bill, so that we might be um, in order, because we do get audited as well, so we need those items. And if you have any questions, you can send them in, and we will answer them um, at the end of this presentation. Now, Ren will go to the reporting piece um, and go over the court output report and how they're changing um, this new year. Thank you, Ursula. Good morning, everybody. This is Ren Hoffner from BSAC. Now I'm going to talk about the court output report. Um, why report to CJCC? First of all, the output report is a requirement by the Accountability Court Funding Committee. Uh, if you're not sure about it, you can look into the special conditions. And also, it will help us to assess the project performance and provide appropriate technical assistance to the courts 
and also will help us adjust by a continued funding to the courts and demonstrate that we added from additional funding for a couple of the courts. So um, for this year, we're going to continue to use the version 2.1 core output report. Um, the only thing you need to be aware of is you are only required to submit it quarterly. Before, you can submit it monthly or quarterly, but this year only quarterly for everybody. And the good news is currently 100% of the cores are already submitting SID and the funder information reports. Very, I'm very excited about this, and this will help us you know, to standardize the way they're submitted. And also, if you are uh, wondering what your number look like, we have uh, generated the aggregated level report for the newsletter from CJCC every quarterly. So if you want to sign up by the MailChimp on the CJCC website, and you will receive the, the report I put out every quarter. And also, the output reports alert CJCC about the course activity and number of vendors served. That will ensure the grant dollars are going to operational courts. Um, okay, what is your computer requirements? Uh, you will need to use Microsoft Office Excel 2003 or more recent. Please consult with your IT department to ensure you have Excel installed in your computer if you don't. And you, can, you need to use Internet Explorer or Firefox or any other web browser to submit a report via the CJCC web portal. Be sure to save output reports to your computer or network once you have already submitted. If we have a technical glitch and do not receive the report, you can simply resubmit what, what, you, what you already is completed. Uh, please know you have to submit the report on this through the uh, CJCC web portal, but not through email to Ursula or Robin or Virginia or myself. Um, so, what does the core output report look like? Uh, where to download it first? It is on the CJCC website, and I included a little um, screenshot of it here. You can see this is what it looks like, and in the red circle at the very bottom of the page is where you click it, and you can download it. All right. Um, Let's take a look. The output report Excel document has two different tabs. If you can see the little uh, red square in the bottom, you can see the two tabs. The first one is grant in, grantee info. The second one is the new offender report. So if also if you do not see the two tabs at the bottom of your screen, you may have to maximize your window. To do so, you need to click the maximizing button at the top of your window, which is highlighted as well. And please make sure you're using the version 2.1. We're going to start with the grant info sheet. In, on this sheet, please make sure you answer every question. So the first one is the court name, which uh, is your project name as well on your subgrant adjustment form. The second cell is for current subgrant number. So please use, use your FY2015 subgrant number. We'll start with A15 or J15. And the third one is the fiscal agent name. It's the name of the entity to whom the subgrant is awarded. Uh, basically, usually it's your county commissioner or your uh, city um, government, you know, government. And please do not put a person or an individual's name in there. It's for your physical agent. It should be a. It should be an organization. Um, the person completing the form is the name of the person who's actually filling out this form. It could be a program coordinator, or it could be another um, official or another personnel in your court. Uh, and then we need your phone number and an email address. Um, you also need to tell us what type of court are you. We built in a drop-down list for you, so please choose from the drop-down list. Um, the same thing applies to court circuits. Tell me what circuit you're located. And if you are an implementation court, please tell us you are, you are. And if you are, then you need to answer the date of the project implement, implementation date. Uh, make sure only answer this if you are an implementation court. If you're already operational, you don't have to answer this one. And we also want to know the new offenders. Um, have you, do you, did you, did any new offenders start your program this month? Uh, if yes, please select yes, and no, uh, just select no. We also want to know the previous offenders, offenders who are still in your program from the previous month. 
Again, please make sure you answer every question. Now we're going to go into the second tab, which is New Offender Report Sheet. You only need to answer this sheet if you serve new offenders for the reporting month. Basically means if you have new people coming in, for example, in July you have two people, then you need, you need to fill out this um, the second sheet. But if you, if you didn't serve anybody, you don't have to. Uh, well, what do we mean by new offenders? They include an offender who may have either been terminated from your program or uh, exited, but is back for a new offense. And here is a screenshot of what the second the new offender report sheet will look like. So first of all, you need to uh, in, uh, you need to input the ICE ID number, which is the state ID number um, assigned to an offender upon arrest. This number should appear on the uh, GCIC rap sheet on the front page, which should be in the offender's file. If your court serves juvenile offenders or the parents of a child in a deprivation case who do not have ICE ID, please use sequential numbers, starting with number one preceded by a year and a dash. For example, the first offender will be 2015-1. And uh, the defects personal ID numbers can also be used. Please note each ID in the offender's case file uh, so that the CJCC can validate this data during a site visit. Uh, also keep the count rolling from one month to the next. So basically means do not start at one again every single month. The second column is the offender birth date. So please enter the offender birth date in the format specified, which is two digits for month, slash two digits of date, and slash and four digits of year. Uh, if the first date is unknown, please type in unknown. Uh, the third column is the offender race. So choose from the drop-down list. We have a drop-down list of choices for you, including African American, Caucasian, uh, so on and so forth. If his or her race is unknown, please select unknown. Um, the fourth column is the offender gender. We also have a drop-down list, so please select from the drop-down list, and if his or her gender is unknown, please select unknown. Uh, number five is reporting month. This is very important since we're changing it to quarterly this year. Um, please choose from the drop-down list. This selection should coincide with the month of the new offender started your program. So, for example, the first quarterly output report is due in October this year, so you should have all your offenders starting your program from July, August, and September. All right. And then the number six is offender county of residence. Uh, we also have a drop-down list. Include all 159 counties in Georgia. So select the county in which the offender resided at the time the offense was committed. Um, last but not least is, uh, is the LSIR scores. Um, this was added last year um, by the request of the funding committee. So um, what is the LSIR? It's a level of service inventory re revised score. It's a quantitative survey of offender attributes and their situations relevant to level of supervision and treatment decisions. It is designed for age 16 and older, which means the score is a um, which means all courts should have the LSIR score record, record for their program participants except juvenile courts. Um, the score is an actual number that places participants in a range minimum to maximum on a scale of 0 to 50 of risks for, re for recidivism and treatment supervision needs. Uh, we built in the drop-down list for the score of 0 to 50. And uh, so if please enter the score for this offender and if his or her LSR score is unknown, please select unknown. All right, that's all the two sheets for the um, Coelpool report. So now you're done, how are you going to submit it to us? First, please save your Coelpool report with the following name convention. If your subgrantee number, the A15 or J15, and the underscore the month. So basically, that there's examples, A15-A-25 underscore January or underscore July. Um, and then you're going to go to the same website where you downloaded a report to submit your report. Um, please note, do not submit reports via email. We're not going to uh, consider, if you submit it via email, we're not going to consider it being received by us. 
Uh, also, the properly completing form is important. CJCC will not process reimbursement without a completed form. Um, here, as many of you know, we do have a uh, quarterly report quick sheet on our website. So you can you feel free to browse it if you have any questions. And here's our contact information. Me, Ursula, I'm sorry I forgot to add Virginia's information in here. Um, but you can probably find her information on, oh, it's on the next slide. Okay. So we have a links and resources. Okay, so okay, here's all the contact information have Aisha Ford. Ursula Kelly, Virginia Dixon. Um, so if you have any question regarding the financial reports, you can feel free to contact those folks. If you have anything related to the poor output report, Ren Hoffner is your person here to contact. And um, we also included some helpful, helpful links and resources. Always uh, feel free to, to go to our CJCC website and also go to the um, Georgia Convoluted Course website if any have, have any questions. And now we're going to open the Q&A session. If you have any questions, please feel free to type in the question panel, and then we're going to answer them individually. Give us one moment, we're going to go down through the question. Okay, one of the first questions, um, Beverly said, can we get the slides? Yes, we will be emailing those slots out when you registered. Um, if you're not the project director, we'll send them out to all of the project directors. But if you're not the project director, when you register, we have your email, so we'll send them out to those emails as, as well. Um, can we still submit court output reports monthly? No, they're requesting quarterly. Um, and why they're doing that is because um, some people were not able to submit their LSI scores or get them in a timely manner. So doing this quarterly, it will give you enough time to get that information and put the correct information on that court output report. Rand, do you have anything else? Uh, yes. Um, to, to this question, like I talked to the funding committee because um, for some of the course, you have a grace period of 60 to 90 days for you to enter the LSIR score into the core output report, and that's why, like Ursula said, we're uh, extending it to the quarterly this year. Uh, you can still use the core output report for your own tracking purposes, but just do not submit it to us until the quarter is over. You can just save it on your, uh, you know, your computer for your own reference. Okay. Um, this is Glenda. Glenda, you asked that I explain the match part again. Um, on your budget sheet, um, you or in your application, you said that you would use um, different things for match. So this year, your grant award total, it, we took your grant award total and divided it by nine, and that came up with your match. And that is also how you would do your reimbursement. 
Um, if your match on your award, like I said, if your award on your award was eight thousand dollars, that was your match, uh, or on your reimbursement, you would take the total of your reimbursement. If your reimbursement was eight thousand dollars, you would divide it by nine, and then that would give you eight hundred and eighty-eight dollars and eighty-eight cents. That would be your match for that particular SER. So each time you send in the SER, you would take the total and divide it by nine, and that will give you your match. And what we mean by match, if you said treatment, that your court would use treatment as match. So when you pay your treatment bill to say, um, who is the yeah. treatment provider? Yeah. Red, not, not Redwood, but um, Rivers Edge or Horizon or whoever your treatment provider is, um, if you pay them $10,000, in the first quarter, you have met your match if your match is $8,000. What you would send in is that invoice with a copy, a proof of payment. And then um, you, at the top, you would label it, this is my match. Um, and then we'll look and we'll say, okay, your match was $8,000. This bill was for $10,000 and you, you have proof that it was paid, so you met your match requirement. Then for the rest of the grant period, you will not need to send in anything else concerning match because you met your match requirement. If you don't do that, say if you're using the coordinator's salary, that the county is paying the coordinator's salary, and um, the, her salary, your match for the quarter, again, is $888.88, and her salary was um, $1,000. For this particular reimbursement, you have met the match. So you would send in proof of that she was paid. Um, you can send in something from the payroll registry and just use it, uh, match, say this is my match for this quarter. Um, I hope that answers your questions, but if not, um, after this webinar you can call me directly and we can kind of um, go over some stuff on the phone and I can kind of um, help you with the match. Does backup documentation for the SDR have to be mailed in or can it be scanned in email? Um, it should be mailed with the packet. Everything should come together, but I know some of you have emailed it in the past. Um, it makes it easier when everything comes together and then we don't have to go to our email and search and you know put it in a special place to remember, hey, they sent their matching in. Uh, I mean, excuse me, they sent their, in, uh, their proof of payment in um, via email. If you could send everything together, that really helps us and we can process and get it to go in for you. you just okay. Okay. Uh, are you, one of the questions is, are you able to submit match in one quarter quarterly report? Um, you can. If you met the match requirement, you can do that. Um, Next question, um, does offenders from previous months include offenders who were terminated that month from the program? Um, the question is, um, Angela is asking, does offenders from the previous month mm -hmm. include offenders who were terminated from the program? So if you were terminated from the program, do I include that on my sheet, on my court output report? I think that depends when this offender was terminated. If it was terminated during the reporting quarter, yes, you will include that number in there. Okay. And Angela, if you have any questions, if this does not answer your question, you can email Ren directly and she can find out and get you some more information about uh, this for the court output report. For the court output reports, um, Anita, the question is, for the court output reports, what month will we submit quarter one? That is due. Your reimbursement form, which is where you're going to get paid, that's due October 15th, as, long as, as well as the court output report. That is due as well on October 15th. It's always 15 days after the, after the end of the quarter.
Um, the next question, I think I've already answered this. If all supporting documents were attached to the SER, can they now be emailed? No. We need that original signature when we send it over for payment. Um, what we do here is we process it. We sign off on your original uh, SER, um, and we generate documentation that goes over with that original signature. So say, um, I hope that this never happens, but um, if something happened and you were misusing funds, they go back and they check that if we have the original signature and all that, uh, and they do that as well when, when they're auditing to make sure we're following the procedures that we need to. So no, they need to be mailed in there. Um, and to, yeah, to our um, address. Okay, this is a good question, and this one is for Rand. Uh, it says, uh, if submitting quarterly output reports, when we submit the question move, but it was, I think uh, it was quarterly, um, the question kind of moves here. Okay, here it is. If submitting quarterly output reports, when we submit, which month should we use with the grant number? So if you're doing it for July, August, September, mm -hmm. um, and then the month, um, I'm going to let Rand answer that if she wants the first month or if she wants a little bit of all of the months, that way we'll know on this end of the list. Okay, so what you will save your Excel should be, let me see the format here, um, it should be the subgrant sub number underscore the first month underscore the last month. So for example, you're submitting in October for your July to September data, and so your file should be named as your grant number underscore July underscore September. So we will know this is a three-month worth of data from your court. Does that answer your question? Um, that was one. I don't know if cool. Okay, this is a question. Okay, Stacy, it says our mental health court program does not use LSIR, therefore we won't have a score to enter. Is there anything else we need to do to satisfy that requirement? And I'll let Ren um, answer that question. If right. you're not using LSIR, yeah. Um, according to the funding committee. Every court, except juvenile court, are supposed to use LSAR right now. Um, if you somehow the court is not using it, you may want to have a conversation with Jody Overcash or somebody at the funding committee. Or um, actually, do me a favor. Can you send me an email after this webinar so I can forward that information to the funding committee and see what we want to do? Um, but for every court, except juvenile court, you supposed to you supposed to use LSAR. Okay, so in the past, this is a good question also, Kathy, do we need to mail the copy of the court output report with the SDR? Um, in the past, that little thank you note that said, yes, I have, I have um, uploaded my uh, court output report, you would attach it to your SDR. No, we do not need that anymore. Um, and that's a great question. Thank you for asking it. No, we don't need that anymore. Um, in the past, we did that for processing purposes and to upload, but now, um, no, you don't need to include that little thank you note I've done my uh, report because we will look out there on a quarterly basis. And if we don't see it um, on, say, the next quarterly report, which is due October the 15th or October the 16th, you will receive an email from myself or Virginia soon that you are delinquent on your report. And now it will go to the project director as well as the judge to let them know that y'all are uh, delinquent. So no, you don't need to um, include that with your SER. Go back to Anita. Okay, I think, um, Anita, you just asked another question. I'm not for sure we answered the question or um, ran answered the question the way you wanted. But you said you wanted to use uh, I want to know what month to use, for instance, grant number slash January was your example, but it was for the entire quarter. Right. So 
for so for your quarter, like I said before, you're if you're reporting the July to September data, you should have your uh, grand number underscore July underscore September. So basically means the first months of this quarter and last months of this quarter. So we know which quarter you're submitting. So I hope that answered your question. If not, um, if it did not uh, answer your question, Anita, please um, shoot me an email or shoot Ran an email and we can kind of um, talk to you about that. Okay, this is a question. I think this one is for Ren as well. Mm -hmm. It says, under the Family Drug Court program, do we need to start the number over with the calendar year or the grant fiscal year? So they have juvenile, so you can kind of explain that. Um, I think since we're starting this physical year right now, everything will uh, coincide with the state physical year cycle right now. So, for example, if you have any new people coming into your court this July, which we're in right now, you will start with 2015-1 and roll over. And until you hit June 2015, that will be your last month of the state fiscal year. Uh, so from now on, we're going to do the state fiscal year cycle. Okay, there is a question. I'm not for sure. Let me read it. Okay, there was a question. I'm not for sure. Um, the question is, the court output report will be required prior to the quarterly report, correct? No, everything is due on the same day now. It's due, um, the reimbursement is due October 15th. The court output will, report will be due October 15th. And the quarterly report, even though you update, um, upload it to our website, to when Adobe, um, that is for AOC. They actually pull that information from our website. So, uh, yes, that goes to them on the 15th. So everything will be done on the 15th. You can, um, like I said, with the reimbursement, you can still do your reimbursement monthly. If you are one of the courts that need to do it monthly, you can do that monthly. Um, that's not a problem. Or you can do it quarterly like you've been doing. But everything will be due on that 15th. There's another question. Um, what about the STAR for mental health courts? The funding committee just approved a full, full, provided a full training for the two instead of LSIR, the mental health courts only. That is something, uh, Christy, thank you for answering that question. I will have to find out about that. I will have to, um, after this, I will shoot an email to the, the funding committee and I will get back with you, uh, Christy, on that particular question. I am writing down your name, so um, expect to hear something back um, on that. Um, I wasn't uh, aware of the STAR for Mental Health Court um, as of yet, so I will uh, ask them and get back to you. Okay. Um, I think that we have... Okay, there is one more question. I am using the unknown option for LSIRs that come back from the treatment provider as non-computable. Is this okay? And the question is again, I am using an unknown option for LSIRs that come back from the treatment provider as non-computable. Is that okay? And I'm going to let Ryan answer that. Um, I would have a question for you. Why the treatment provider will say that our score is not computable? Because are they using LSAR for a needs assessment for a assessment before the person um, get admitted into the court? Um, yeah. Let's, okay. Um, I think Ursula is writing down your name. Maybe you and I need to have a conversation after the webinar so we can go through this question a little bit later. Um, but you're supposed to have a LSIR score coming from your treatment provider or if your court is doing the assessment by yourself, then you're supposed to have one. And if you don't, you have to put in unknown. But um, we're giving you much more time this year, which is 
90 days after the person is admitted, and you're supposed to have a score already for this person. Um, but we will have a conversation about it later. She's asking for it to just tell Amanda. Okay, uh, Amanda, we'll get that to you as and well. Uh, and Stephanie, um, the question was the, uh, the the mental health court coordinators about the start assessment. Our mental health coordinators um, also utilize the start assessment as opposed to the LSIR scores. So um, when I find out the answer, I will get that back to you. I'll email um, the mental health group. I think this is all of the questions, and if we did not answer your question for some unknown reason, we're scrolling down, but they keep uh, they come in periodically, and they kind of go to different areas. Um, if we did not answer your question, please um, shoot me an email, and um, we can get your questions answered. I have one. Yeah. It says, will a duplicate of the webinar be available on your website? Yes, and we would also email it out. We are recording this. So we will uh, email um, the, the recording out uh, to everybody. And it will also be on our website up under uh, training in the webinar. So up under the accountability court uh, link on our website. But if we somehow did not answer your questions or you did not get a good understanding of something on today, please email us. Um, and if it's something that we uh, can't really answer, we can go to the funding committee and uh, get an answer from them. Um, so, um, yeah, please email us. Um, if nothing else, if there's no more questions, and like I said, uh, you can email uh, myself, and most of you have my email address, and um, you have Virginia. Uh, if you're at A Court, A15 Court, which is juvenile and DUI, I know that um, Virginia has sent something out to you. Um, you have her email as well. You can email her, and we can find out. And as well as Marianne Hefner, Hoffner, I'm sorry, <laughs> Hoffner, um, you can email her about the court output report, and we will try to uh, get your questions answered. If there's nothing else, we thank you for attending this uh, webinar um, on today. We really appreciate it. Uh, thanks, and have a great day.